You would have received it, but allow me to read. Sam is a researcher who plays in amateur football league. He has a grade three complete tear of his anterior cruciate ligament and has been referred by his physician to Meg, a physiotherapist, for recovery. Sam has opted against surgery after discussion with his physician, and therapy is aimed at rehabilitating him. This will take about nine months. During this time, Sam converses with Meg about his dream of becoming a professional football player. Meg assumes that he has also shared this information with his physician. Following his recovery, Sam is informed by his doctor that his knee, while functional, will likely never be strong enough to support a footballing career. Sam would require a full reconstructive surgery of the injured ligaments, from, from which recovery would take a further 12 months. This totals almost two years of injury that Sam will have to endure in his prime and will severely hamper any prospective career as a professional footballer. He subsequently makes a claim against, uh, against his therapist and his physician of failing to advise him of the downsides of non-surgical rehabilitation and failing to inform him of the necessity of surgery to assume playing at a high intensity. So shall we start off with the first question? Is this physiotherapist liable or not checking with Sam whether he shared his dream of being a professional football player with his primary physician? And if so, to what extent is the physiotherapist liable in this case? May I first please ask Vanessa what you think the liabilities are? Vanessa. Thank you, Prof. Okay, so I think what's important um, in this case is the context within which uh, Meg learns of this information, which is uh, Sam's dream of becoming a professional football player. If Meg knows that you know, the exercises or the therapy that she is giving will not rehabilitate Sam to the level of allowing him to be a professional football player, then I think that is something that she must highlight to him. And it's something that you know, she, she has to address with him. Um, but I suppose the more important issue in this case is whether there's an ongoing conversation between the physiotherapist and uh, the doctor or the physician who actually referred Sam to the physiotherapist. Thank you, Vanessa. Dr. Dave and Dr. Tan, would you like to add to this, to what Vanessa has mentioned? Perhaps I will have a stab at it first. Um, I guess, uh, as far as the physiotherapist is concerned and with relation to the new civil law act, um, the question will be, would the physiotherapist be in possession of the knowledge that, uh, you know, of, of the various surgical treatments uh, that are available for uh, a complete ACL uh, tear or rupture? Uh, so if, if, if the physiotherapist is, uh, is in possession of such knowledge and then she can respond to uh, you know, uh, a, a, a change perhaps in or a new information that's coming from the patient, then possibly her liability uh, in increases. Um, I think that the, the, the second element to, to all of this is um, you know, uh, what kind of uh, conversation went on uh, between the, uh, the patient and the surgeon to start with. Um, you know, it, I, again, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not going to give medical advice on, on this webinar. But my understanding of a complete tear of an ACL, uh, you know, uh, for it to completely heal uh, with non-conservative mechanisms because of the vascular supply uh, is quite limited. 
so that and for a young patient like this, um, what kind of conversations went on in order to pursue a conservative line of management? Uh, you know, has to come out before we can even think about you know uh, you know whether that was it was appropriate for uh, the patient to be. Uh, referred to the physiotherapist and then uh, had something changed and you know um, whether that information should have been fed back um, or, or whether the person who received that information was in a, in a position to, to feed back the information to the original surgeon to review the original treatment plan. So that, that those are in broad ways how I would think about this case. Thank you, Dave. Chen Xie? Thanks, Prof. Uh, I think this case uh, highlights two points to me. The first one is that I think this case is a good reflection of multidisciplinary care uh, these days. And multidisciplinary care doesn't just include between doctors. It also includes our allied health professionals, particularly in some conditions where their input and involvement makes them uh, equally important, if not more than the doctor. So uh, with this aspect, I, I think there has to be recognition that there must be a, uh, adequate uh, transmission of information between both parties actively, and it's a bilateral communication. And it should not be something that just depends on uh, in the past where the doctors will refer to the notes and make a decision and make a recommendation. Uh, I think this, then the second point which I, uh, I would like to raise maybe for discussion is um, under the new Section 37, it reads as if it's an uh, attempt to codify Bolum, Bolitho, Hitchcock into a statute. And then, um, because at the, at the same time, it also seems to apply across the board and includes all healthcare professionals. I think that's quite interesting because uh, Bolum itself, originally the intent, if I'm not mistaken, is to apply only to doctors. Uh, it was very clear. But with the new section 37 and then with the wording to include all healthcare professionals, I just wonder now, has it now applied bolum uh, across different healthcare professions, in particular our allied healthcare prof professionals, because um, this seems to be an extension of the common law. Uh, because if we had gone back to the common law strict uh, in the past, if a physiotherapist, uh, allied health professionals treatment were to come under scrutiny, uh, perhaps it would not be a bolum test, but maybe it's something which the court will depend on the standard of care, on the, what the reasonable physiotherapist would do. So this really makes me wonder, this new section 37, uh, has it, will it be going beyond what is, you know, what has always been defined the common law? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Uh, that actually leads us into uh, what the role of another care provider is. And uh, so maybe I'd like to put this question back. If indeed, I mean, we, we, I think it's clear that Section 37 uh, makes it clear that there is a duty for everybody who is involved in care. So since there's a duty on the physiotherapist, would it suffice if the physiotherapist documents in the notes what was observed or understood or learned from the patient? or the therapist or the other professional must take much more active steps rather than just documenting. Vanessa? Um, I would say documenting would be the basic step. So definitely, I think the documentation should be there. Um, it's, it's something that the patient has said uh, to the physiotherapist. I think it should be documented. Um, as to whether the physiotherapist can do more, I would think there should be an ongoing conversation between all the healthcare professionals who are participating in the care and management of, of the patient. So I think you know, that conversation should, should happen in addition to the documentation. Thank you, thank you. So we know one standard is the importance of documenting whatever patients refer to us. Now, then you mentioned that it's always better if more is built or more is done from that communication. May I just like to uh, ask Dave, what are the practical difficulties that will be experienced 
by a therapist trying to communicate with a physician who is probably five kilometers away. Um, so how is all this going to affect actual day-to-day -day management? Thank you, Dave. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I think Chunji has already brought out, you know, how um, the care of patients these days is moving, you know, beyond multidisciplinary care to interprofessional care, you know, between professions, between doctors, physiotherapists, pharmacists, nurses, and, and so on. And, you know, I think Atul Gawande has described this quite nicely to say that, you know, we no longer think of the single clinician as being, you know, the source or the leader who will be able to manage all of the patient's problems. And the metaphor that's being used is that of a sort of a pit crew in a Formula One you know, race where the, the, the car comes in and many people work in a very specialized way, but ultimately all of them are still working together for the benefit of the, of the patient. Um, and I, I think this sort of thing uh, requires a, a couple of things. One is um, the team needs to have collective responsibility of the patient. Uh, I think that's, that's increasingly important. If a team is going to look after the patient, the team needs to be responsible. Um, and, and so, so and every member of the team needs to be able to feel as if that, you know, the care of this patient, I am, I am a responsible member of, the, of this, uh, of, of, for that care. And in that kind of context, uh, if information comes up that is really important, that is potentially treatment changing, um, it is, I think, uh, I think the onus is on the member of that team to raise that information up. So these days, you know, in, 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 in the wards and the ICUs, nurses are given the, the I think, the, uh, not only responsibility, but also being given the, the ability to raise up red flag patients, you know, to, to senior doctors if things are not changed. Similarly, if a pharmacist I, uh, identifies that I've made an error in, in, the, in, in the, the prescription, it is not just merely a documentation that is done. You know, I get a phone call uh, in order to, you know, to alert me that oh, this is, I think this is important uh, and, and please take note of it. So uh, that sort of uh, responsibility is probably going to be needed if we're going to manage patients uh, as teams. And, and if you want to link that back to ethics, um, I think in, in the SMC ethical guidelines, I think the, the key element to all of this is collegiality, right? So we need to be able to, uh, to trust uh, and we need to respect uh, uh, our fellow colleagues um, in, and in order to have an open environment where people are not afraid of, hi of you know, traditional hierarchies, people are not afraid of being told off and, uh, and uh, you know, there is open communication and feedback such that you know, uh, you know, there are no gaps in the in the care of the patient. I, I guess that's how I would I, I would look at at, uh, at at this kind of team management. Thank you. Uh, is there a question coming in from the floor now? Yes, there is, Roy. Thank you very much. Uh, we've already had quite a few questions, so that I, it, it's great that um, all of you are actively engaged. So um, this is um, actually two questions, but it's kind of related. And I think we can have it up on the screen. Um, the question is, uh, for, for case A, is the physiotherapist actually offering medical advice per section 37 concerning the pros and cons of surgery? Uh, it seems that the remit, this is the remit of the referring physician, the physio would only normally offer medical advice on rehabilitation rather than surgery. And if I can also connect this to another question that was asked, a sort of related question, um, which has to do with what a healthcare professional is in terms of the definition in section 37, because um, some of our audience may be wondering the extent to which healthcare professionals um, are included under section 37. So if I could perhaps um, direct this question at Vanessa first. Okay, um, could we get section seven up? So I think what the second question is referring to is that um, subsection seven actually says a healthcare professional means an individual who practices a profession that provides medical advice. So it is actually limited to a, you know, uh, someone who actually provides advice. Um, I do think, 
an argument, going back to the first question, I do think an argument can be made that what the physiotherapist is providing is actually treatment. So it's treatment prescribed by the physician. Um, but on the other hand, an argument can also be made that the physiotherapist is providing advice with respect to the rehabilitation or, you know, the therapy that she is prescribing or that she is giving to Sam. So early on, I spoke about whether um, the physiotherapist knows that the exercise that she's giving or the rehabilitation that she's giving would have limits, you know, uh, and would limit Sam's uh, intentions to be a professional football player. Then I do think, you know, she, she needs to um, act on that. So just to be clear, Vanessa, if I can follow through on that question, um, healthcare professionals would include uh, individuals from our allied health uh, group, such as yes. physiotherapists? Yes, I think there's no question about that. Right. And I think it's quite clear from subsection 7. Right. And nurses, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, sub, the subsection is drafted quite inclusively, so it doesn't say only these professionals, it drafts it to say includes these professionals. So would that just then cover registered healthcare professionals? I don't think it is limited to registered healthcare professionals. Okay. Thank you. It does, yeah, it does okay. say, you know, um, an individual who practices a profession that provides medical advice. So I think even uh, arguably pharmacists, if they're giving advice um, in relation to medications, um, they would be caught under this section as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, for these clarifications. So we, we can get a fair amount of clarity on the scope of 37 with respect to who comes under it. The moment you offer advice, you come within it. So you've got to decide whether you are capable of or whether you want to. So that brings us now to the next thing. And maybe Chun Chie, I'd like you to, to think about this. See, so we have, we have understood that colleagues are going to pick up new information. All right. And that information should be moving it shouldn't remain in place so that those who are in a position to act on the new information can act on it and not stumble on it by chance. So maybe, Chun Chie, if you could share, what are steps that a primary, the first person, when you refer to somebody, could do, or maybe you are already doing, which you find is a very, uh, what shall reliable way of one, encouraging response from your colleagues who are co-managing co and also to make it easier for them to reach. We all know how difficult it is for somebody outside the hospital to reach anybody in the hospital. What have you found works well or what do you think could work well? Uh, okay, thanks, Prof. Um, I think it first it starts with maybe I would just like to bring up what Dave mentioned earlier about uh, a kind of a mindset shift in that doctors are often not the only dominant player in the management of a patient's condition. I think particularly in this case where the treatment plan prescribed is a non-surgical uh, modality. Um, so the physiotherapy plays a very important role. Um, so I, with regards at the individual level, I think what the maybe some of the things as a uh, physician or as a doctor, I, I find it useful will be um, number one, besides having a very clear referral letter, meaning what are the objectives of the reason for the referral and um, the follow-up date so that whoever is helping to look after the patient knows what are the intervals and how often I'll be seeing the patient. Uh, that's one way. A second way is, of course, um, besides documentation and doctor reading the notes regularly, the other aspect will be the, the recipient of this uh, referral to be aware that there are other means of communication and 
that's beyond documentation. Uh, in this day and age, where we are all moving towards tech, telemedicine, uh, there's email, okay, which can be uh, used as a more form of highlighting certain information. And the other one, which we're all very familiar with, is the tiger text um, function that the chat group that we all healthcare professionals are registered with. So I think, so to summarize, I think first it must start with a uh, kind of a mindset change across the board. And I, I feel that section 37 will somehow nudge everybody towards that because it's such a broad uh, you know, coverage. And number two, at the individual level, uh, I think everybody must try and really work, look at how various measures can be done to make the communication easier and smoother. Thank you. Thank you for, for describing the different ways. I was just remembering the, the various referral letters that I have written in the past. Rarely have I indicated in the last paragraph, please do not hesitate to let me know if you pick up any information that may be relevant. Here is my number. And this is how you can contact me. I think that's something that we all, I guess, must have this mindset. I think once the setting is changed, this is. I think we the last thing that we probably wanted to look here was we talked about notes. How far back would we expect? Uh, care providers to venture into because notes can sometimes be quite long, cover decades. What sort of guidance can we give regarding how far back to go? Mm, let's see. Maybe I, I, I'll start with the doctors first. Maybe we'll see how do y'all decide in date. Forget section 37. How do you work it out practically? Then we will know what are the principles you do. Dave. I'm, I'm not sure there is a one perfect answer to, to this question. And it is probably uh, dependent on the context and the specialty. Um, uh, and perhaps even the presentation of the patient. Um, so I, I, I guess from a from my, my own specialty in respiratory medicine, uh, what will be relevant is all the previous respiratory investigations, the the, the most latest uh, uh, thoracic imaging, um, and then perhaps anything else that may be relate, related to uh, the presentation of the patient. So if the patient has got dyspnea or breathlessness as a presenting complaint, then I may look into the latest cardiac notes and so on. Uh, and I think that th th that gives you an example of how this is context specific because it depends on what you are looking for yeah, in particular. I, I don't think there is a blanket uh, uh, responsibility to look for everything and anything, which is not actually reflective of true clinical practice. Um, so sim similarly, uh, a, a surgeon may, may, may look back at previous anesthesia, maybe complications, because that may influence the approach, uh, previous complications, previous surgery done at the same site. Um, the, the surgeon may, may look at an orthopedic uh, surgeon may look at, uh, you know, the, the functional uh, status of the patient uh, before uh, from previous documentations in physiotherapy and so on. Uh, and, then, and again, if this is an ongoing review, if you have referred to a physiotherapist specifically as the main modality of treatment, it, it is probably reasonable to expect you to go back and either, either get a, referral, a, a reply back from the physiotherapist as to the progress or actually look, uh, look through the physio notes to see you know, whether the treatment is working. Because obviously, if, if, you, if, if that is what is the recommended treatment, you will want some feedback to know whether it is working or not. So, so that in, in general, uh, I think that would be uh, uh, the, the, the broad answer that it is context specific. It is, and it, it, we need to look, we need to identify exactly what we are trying to achieve with this patient. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Chun Chia, would, would you have anything to add to what Dave has said? 
Uh, okay, I, 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 the other consideration I wonder uh, is whether it's applicable is the issue of time, which probably will crop up in one, this discussion will come up in uh, one or if not some of the cases later on. The amount of time that uh, the doctor has uh, is allowed to, is allocated because uh, the, many doctors actually work in, a, in, in an institution where the timing for each consultation is more or less determined by the institution. It's not so much, uh, I mean, it's, well, we, we can stretch it and there's some control of it, but there are guidelines also on that. So I think that's one aspect to consider. And the other thing uh, I would like to point out is, um, just as I think we talk about there, should, uh, there shouldn't be any information dump on patients. Uh, I, I hope it also works the other way around for, for no information dumping on doctors because uh, Sometimes records uh, seem, you know, is used as a default repository and then uh, there has already got to be a change in this practice of just uploading everything onto the records and then thinking that the doctor, whoever is seeing the patient and the receiving it, it doesn't have to be a doctor. It can be any healthcare professional who have the time and the capacity to pour through everything. Uh, to me, that's equivalent to information dump on the healthcare professional, which I think a reasonable court would not really uh, advocate. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. I, I think that's all I have to add. So thank you, Chen Xie and Dave. So you have provided us with practical and what I think are reasonably sound ways of approaching this question. Vanessa, if these are clearly articulated by the physician or the healthcare professional, would they generally meet the standards that are uh, sort of stated within the, within the law? Yes. So I think uh, Chun, uh, Dave and Chuncha hit the nail on the head when they said, you know, it, essentially it's a matter of reasonableness, right? Um, so Minister Edwin Tong, when he read uh, the amendment, uh, Section 37 to the Civil Law Act, he did say and he clarified that it's not intended uh, for a doctor or a healthcare professional to go through volumes and volumes of medical records, right? We're, we're not expecting uh, anyone to do that. Uh, it's really about what the healthcare professional has reasonable access to and also whether in the circumstances of the specific case, um, you know, based on the discussion with the patient and the context of the consultation, whether taking everything into consideration, you know, it warrants the doctor to perhaps go into the notes and look up a specific point or a specific issue regarding the patient's condition. So some of the factors that I think are relevant will be, you know, the age of the medical records, how voluminous it is, you know, whether this is a patient with many, many comorbidities and their volumes and volumes of medical records, the contents of the discussion that, you know, the patient is having with the healthcare professional at that specific consultation. And also, you know, whether there's anything that has has been raised by the patient during the consultation, which would prompt uh, the healthcare professional to investigate further. All right. Thank you. I think I'd just like to pass over to Sumi now. Sumi, you have got a question. We have a few more, just a few more minutes for this segment. We have really gone deep into Sam and Meg, and they've helped us a lot. Sumi. Yeah, well, we're doing very well for time. Yeah, we, we do, um, I think, have nearly 10 minutes, actually, um, um, for, for this segment. So moving on to the questions that, and thank you for, for all of you who are posting questions in the Q&A. Uh, please do keep them coming. So related to what we've just discussed about um, the notes and, you know, how they could be voluminous and so on, we've had two kind of related questions on this. The first one was about audio and video recording. And would doing this as part of the management options between the patient and the treatment team, is, is that something that should be recommended? Because it's not always easy to record um, all discussions um, on paper. And related to that, um, we, when we're talking about how teams usually work nowadays in institutions, it tends to be quite multidisciplinary. And you know, when we're thinking about providing holistic care for the patient, um, when we're thinking about MIRA, the, the National Electronic Health Record, does it then require the doctor who sees the patient to refer to MIRA for all of the health issues of the patient, including those in other disciplines, right? So not necessarily just his or her own discipline. Um, now, 
Hmm, I'm trying. Let, let's see who we should uh, direct this to first. I think it's, you know, as much as we are looking at the legal issues, there are also ethical issues here to, to, to think about, right? Um, so, so maybe, Dave, do you mind if I, I kind of start off with you first? Sure. Um, maybe I'll, I'll answer the second question first, because I think that's a little bit easier for me. Um, the, the, the question of whether, what, what we need to look up on any HR. Um, um, I, I think that if you think about it or what we teach our medical students that when we see the patient for the first time and we take a history, we do need to know what the patient's past medical history is and we do need to know the patient's drug history, right? Uh, and in many ways, NEHR has helped us and simplified that process quite a lot. Um, so in, in, I think to a, lot, to a lot of people, NEHR can be a, a, a big help rather than an impediment. Uh, should there be something that's hidden in the NEHR, uh, you know, that is, uh, that is, uh, that, 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 you know, should be unearthed? Uh, again, I don't, I'm not sure that's the way it should, we should look at it. NEHR should complement our history taking. So when we take the past medical history, we should ask the patients, and if the patient brings up something relevant that we need clarification, that's how I would use the NEHR to, to go back and clarify something that the patient may not remember or not sure, which I think is relevant to the current uh, uh, problem at hand, rather than think of NEHR as something that I need to um, you know, uh, dig into and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and summarize. I, I take Junjia's point about information dump on healthcare professionals. I think that's a real big problem that we have. Unfortunately, the biggest perpetrators of information dumping is also doctors because of cut and paste. And there's so much of misinformation, wrong information that is, that is literally perpetuated from one clinic to another clinic, largely because of cut and paste and when we see a patient rather than actually doing what we teach students to do and take a past medical history and a history of presenting complaint, we just cut and paste it in, assume that what was asked and what was said before what it, uh, it, it is what it is as literally a, a, a lazy shortcut. So, um, you know, uh, with, within the profession, we need to, we need to train, uh, you know, uh, each other and, you know, and, and future professionals not to, you know, to continue this kind of information dumping um, uh, and, and make sure that the information that's in the, in the medical record is accurate and relevant. And we also should practice what we teach our students when we see the patients first time and we take a comprehensive history, we really take a comprehensive history and use the NEHR as a adjunct and as a tool rather than, you know, as, uh, as a source of truth and as a, you know, uh, to go in and, and, and clarify all, all, all problems with the patient as, as an alternative to actually talking to the patient, right? Shall I leave it at that and, and let somebody else answer about the audio recordings? Sure. Um, Chuncha, would you have anything to add before we um, ask Vanessa for the, for the more legal kind of opinion? Oh, uh, I think just, yeah, just add on to, I mean, just to want to say that, yeah, I totally agree with what Dave um, highlighted in the last few sentences that NEHR, I feel it's more for targeted selective use in, uh, as an adjunct in patient care rather than it's for a doctor or whoever healthcare professional seeing the patient to pour through the, all the sections and extract the information. Thanks. Thank you. Vanessa? I have Yes. Oh, sorry, Roy. Yeah, go um, ahead, go ahead, please, Sumi. Whether Vanessa might want to just close the loop, at least in terms of Section 37 itself. Yes. Uh, okay, I, I want to address the question on the audio or video recording. So in the work that I do, I can actually see that patients are already recording their doctors. So, you know, often, uh, I don't know if it's done with the doctor knowing or, you know, I have seen patients actually make uh, audio recording or clips of what uh, the doctor has been consulting them. So if you ask me, is it a good idea, you know, to actually regularize it and actually have um, formal uh, recording? I would actually be for it. Um, I, I do think, you know, it can actually help to resolve a lot of disputes. It would help in medical legal management. But of course, that is a, you know, to implement it is a question of resource allocation that goes much uh, many levels higher than us or than this discussion. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, Sumi, I have a, can, can I ask a question myself? 
you know, so I think both Dave and Trin, Dave also would like to say something. So, so Trin, obviously, this is um, a, a topic of great interest to both of you. So, so Dave, um, may, since you had your hand up first, <laughs> oh. our hand up within our own panel, have fun. Um, maybe we'll let you go first, and and then Trin share, and then and then Roy, if that's okay. Yeah, and and I, I mean, I, I can see where Vanessa is coming from, and saying from a dispute resolution perspective, having what is said, you know, uh, you know, captured. Um, it, it is, is helpful. Um, I think, but there is a converse to all of this as well. Um, I mean, medical practice is not only about, you know, preventing litigation. In fact, the vast majority of medical practice is about care for the patient uh, and about, you know, good communication and so on. And I, I think there are some dangers in how people may change the communication when they know that it is being recorded. Uh, and, uh, you know, that may not be for the benefit uh, you know, of patients. Uh, I also think that the healthcare profession can get caught out in many ways by, uh, you know, having everything verbatim, right? Uh, in, in many ways, we are protected because we are the ones who document what should be in the notes. And again, I understand the challenges of, you know, a lot of documentation and, you know, how tedious it can be. Uh, but, you know, tr thinking that, you know, this will only, this will save us time and convenience by, by having everything recorded, even if it were <laughs> practically possible and we had the space and, and so on. I have a lot of doubts about whether, and in the, in, in the overall scheme of things, it will, it will, it will help doctors and doctor patient relationships. Um, yeah, so that, it's just a caveat, uh, you know, away from the dispute resolution perspective that the law brings. Thanks, Dave. Chen uh, I have a question about, yeah, recording that. I, perhaps uh, I just wonder maybe Vanessa can also comment on or answer. Uh, the question I have is uh, secret recordings made by patients during consultation. Are these recordings admissible as evidence in a court during litigation? So this is my first question. The second question is if it's admissible as evidence, will the court place equal weight on this or more weight on this kind of evidence compared to a, the notes written by doctors? Because the recording is probably a lot more extensive and uh, captures every aspect of the consultation compared to the notes. Yeah, so the short answer is yes, it is admissible. So actually, there's no law against, you know, making recordings or even telephone, uh, recording telephone conversation. So I have seen recordings actually been used uh, in, in, in trial and court proceedings uh, for medical cases. Um, the second question was whether the court places more weight. Um, so the court looks at everything that is relevant. Now, if there is a recording which is not consistent with what is documented in the medical records, well, then, you know, it's not so much about the court placing more weight, but then obviously there are questions to ask about how accurate the medical records are, right? And that then affects what sort of uh, the, the court's view of the credibility of the medical records. So if there is an audio recording or video recording, um, I do not see the court ignoring it. I think they will definitely take it into consideration and um, they, they will want to you know, see what, it's, what it says and compare that against the medical records. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I think what I'd like to do is... Uh, there's one, one area which we had not covered, and I'd just like to briefly uh, put this to the panel. Uh, we, we had talked about duties and responsibilities. So very specifically, in this particular case, did the physiotherapist have a responsibility for informing Sam of the benefits or downsides of his chosen treatment. Uh, okay, if pondered, no hands have come up. Uh, I think I'd like to put this question to Chun Chie first. Okay, um, so but Prof, I think this sounds quite more like a legal, legal question, I think, but um, on a professional level. No, no, in fact, forget the law. Okay. Forget the law. You see, as, as fellow uh, colleagues, you know, we, we agreed that we, we, have part, we are partners in the management. Yep. So does my colleague have the responsibility 
to comment on what I have prescribed. Because that's basically what it means. Okay, I think the, uh, so in this case, the physiotherapist uh, has a certain uh, responsibility to communicate to the patient the outcome and uh, the, the, the problems that has, a, that has come up during the, the treatment of this condition. And, but what is equally important is that this communication is also somehow made known to the doctor so that there's no um, a situation where we get different impression or uh, information coming from two different healthcare professionals, which the patient has to process. Thank you, Chen Chie. Dave, what would you like to add to that? Uh, I think that the legalistic uh, response will be, it depends. Um, uh, and and Thanks, uh, because, <laughs> because everything is context specific. I, I think if, if I look at the whole case, my, 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 my sense is, um, I think what we really need to get at is what was the conversation between the doctor and the patient first, right? Because we need to understand what were the expectations and did they have a shared understanding of the problem, right? And what pros and cons were, were communicated uh, before a, uh, a decision was made for physiotherapy as the recommended uh, treatment. The second issue that I would like to bring out is in terms of interprofessional communication, Again, good communication from the doctor's part is to actually tell to, to, in the referral letter to the physiotherapist, actually explain why conservative management is recommended. I mean, and again, in this particular case, because this is a young patient and a conservative uh, approach is a little bit uh, or actually extremely unusual for such a patient with a grade three tear of the ACL. Now, if this was a very elderly patient with high uh, multiple comorbidities, then it is more of a routine uh, referral. And, uh, and uh, similarly, if we have a very elderly patient with multiple comorbidities and we wanted to do surgery on the patient, I think if, if in, part, in, in terms of interprofessional or interdisciplinary uh, communication, it is worthwhile explaining why. So if I wanted to do this, with, if I wanted to send this patient for surgery, I probably need to explain to the anesthetist why you know, we, we, want, we want to take on such unusual risks. And we, if, you, if you start off the conversation on that good premise, then at least a physiotherapist understands, oh, there's a rationale behind why physiotherapy is given for this young patient with a complete tear. And then if some new information comes up, and of course, I think it's, uh, it, it is uh, dependent on the physiotherapist to feed that information back to the physician rather than try to counsel the patient independently on the pros and cons of all the different options, which may be beyond their remit. They may be able to tell the patient some of the limitations of what their treatment is, uh, which is physiotherapy, which is that's, that's within their professional uh, you know, remit. But to go beyond and, and talk about all the other options, it, 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 it doesn't sound very reasonable. And that sort of thing should be fed back to the doctor. And it'll be easier to feedback if they understood right from the start what was the rationale behind the whole uh, treatment plan. Thank you. Uh, I think that you, you have actually very, very succinctly covered what I was going to say, and I'm, so I'm not going to repeat it. All right. So you have everybody heard what was said. Communicate. I think if we are humble, if we are rational, and if we are ready to share, understanding the ethical reasons why we do that, then I think we are all on safe ground. And Section 37 will not come near us. Our goal is not to practice in the vicinity of Section 37, but at a much higher level. So on that note, I'd like to bring this learning from Sam and Meg to a temporary closure. I'm sure the discussions will continue. And I'd just like to invite uh, Sumi to take us through the next case. Sumi, will you please continue? Thank you, Roy. That certainly was a, a very interesting and illuminating discussion um, on case one. And uh, just to let the people who posted questions know that, you know, there are a couple of questions there. Um, even though we've not taken them in relation to case one, they equally apply to some of the other cases that we'll be looking at. So, you know, we will also be, be you know, carrying those over. So please do stay tuned because I'm sure that those will also come up in due course. Uh, 